Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talks at Google. Thanks for tuning in. It sounds like there's a lot of interest on the particular topic we have at hand today, which is uh, parents who lead. Um, and it's especially timely and relevant um, in 2020. Uh, I am joined by Dr. Stu Friedman. He's an incredibly inspirational individual. Um, by way of introduction, he has pioneered the path of organizational psychology, particularly at the intersection of family and leadership. Uh, he's been at my alma mater B School, the Wharton School at UPenn since 1984. He's founded the Wharton Leadership Project, the Work-Life uh, Integration Project. He's a best-selling author, an award-winning teacher, the head of the Ford uh, Leadership Development Center, a consultant, a policymaker, and a radio show host. Welcome, Dr. Friedman. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Of course. From personal experience, I just wish I had this resource 10 to 15 years ago, but I'm very glad it's been crystallized um, into the book that we have today. Um, and the topics that it kind of covers and ranges are it revolve around the symbiotic relationship that is important and paramount to maintain as leaders at the workplace and leaders at home uh, in the form of, of parents of little humans. Um, and we talk a lot at Google about bringing your whole self to work. And, you know, uh, we actually just wrapped up performance review season, which we lovingly call as perf. We talk about lifting yourself while we lift others. And you know, from personal experience, I will also say that parenting has made me a better leader at Google in a lot of ways and vice versa. Um, and as I mentioned and alluded to earlier, 2020 has certainly brought that intersection of family and Google leadership um, together in a very jarring, um, you know, material, tangible, palpable way. Um, so I think this set of topics is just very, very top of mind for a lot of us as we mm -hmm. navigate um, the waters today. Um, in your book, you talk a lot about um, the vision and the values that are correlated to kind of push progress forth across both these realms. Um, and in an effort for the audience to learn a little bit about you, I would love to start at the very beginning, Stu, and just have you talk a little bit about your own upbringing in your family unit, how that dovetailed into your uh, own nuclear family with your wife and now three grown children. Um, so I'll kick it over to you. All right. Well, uh, I was raised in Brooklyn, New York. My uh, my parents were both uh, artists and craftspeople. Uh, I went to public schools there and uh, State University, uh, New York, where I majored in drugs and music. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I somehow got through with a degree. Uh, I lived in Vermont uh, and in upstate New York in the 70s, you know, back to Lander, hippie. Um, shall I continue? Yes. By the way, audience, this is entirely unscripted on yeah. purpose by design to keep it more interesting and lively. So we've gotten off to a no good start. I had no idea you were going to ask me about this. So um, you know, my, my father just uh, died this year. And oh, sorry. He was a photographer and he cut hair for a living. And he was really an inspiration to me, a very loving um, and creative soul. And uh, as I uh, emerged into adulthood, I was interested in psychology. I was interested in um, how people change and how they learn about the world. Um, it, it's it's a long story. I'm 68 years old. I'll try to be brief. But um, my wife and I met uh, when I was applying to graduate school. We were both in a graduate school interview together, like a group interview for a clinical psychology program. And uh, I just fell in love immediately when I saw her. And uh, we, we corresponded a bit after that interview. Neither of us got into the program we were interviewing for that day. Their loss. With, with that was great that it ended up this way because uh, we we both uh, went to different. She was she got um, accepted at the University of Michigan in their clinical psych program, and I had a full ride at the University of Chicago. Nice in social and organizational psychology, which is what I was thinking I would study, um, and we we ended up getting uh, engaged a few weeks after that. Basically, it was. Almost wow. And then I followed her to the University of Michigan, where I studied organizational psychology and a whole a whole new world opened up for me. Um, and I was interested in I was always interested in 
how do you bring together the different parts of your life in a way that that is a creative whole? Yes, which is something that both my parents you know, wrestled with as as artists. You know, with their studios were in our in our small Brooklyn house, uh, as as they were also trying to raise us. I have a younger brother and sister, and um, you know, the challenge of how you do it all is something that was very much a part of my life growing up. And then when our first child was born. Um, now, 33 years ago, uh, then things really changed for me, and I, I became you know, committed to you know, discovering what is it that people need to know about how to bring together the different parts of their lives in a way that works for all of them. Prior to that, my dissertation research was on how do you cultivate leaders? How do you grow people to become who they are you know, capable of being in organizations? That's what I studied. And that's what I was consulting with uh, companies on in the in the 80s. I was helping to develop and was faculty for corporate uh, leadership and learning institutes in the 80s as that was becoming, you know, de rigueur for, for companies uh, at that time. It was kind of an explosion of interest in that. But then when uh, when my son was born and I, I realized uh, that I needed to figure out how I was going to make the world a safe one for him to grow up in. Uh, when I met him for the first time 33 years ago yesterday, I was holding him. I was, I was struck by that. And then right. and I brought the question to my students in the, in the MBA classroom, 1987. I, I asked them, what are you going to do to ensure the, the health and prosperity uh, of the next generation, not just of your, you know, the talent in yeah. your company, but the next generation of people, and uh, that was that was a turning point because in the classroom that day, some people were like, "Why are you asking me this? What do, what is what do children have to do with business? I mean, this is a business school. I, no one cares about your family, professor." There was like a lot of a lot of haters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there were also some people who, men and women who you know, were leaning forward and like, yeah, uh, thank goodness somebody's bringing this up. Um, well, and in response to my question, one of them said, uh, well, you, you're the professor, you tell us. And I realized that that was something I could try to find something out about through my Got research. And, and that's when I started uh, the Work-Life Integration Project while as a kind of uh, side hustle, while I was mainly responsible for growing the leadership program at Wharton. Um, Crazy that it was a side hustle because it's so paramount to good leadership, right? Well, Get, try now, to kind of jostle it all around and prioritize. Now it's accepted. Now you know that. Now your right. generation is like, yeah, of course. How could it's that- It's a known phrase. Work? But I'm telling you, it, right. yeah, nobody really cared. In fact, one of the senior members of my faculty at that time when I was, you know, late thirties, he said, why would you want to shift from studying, you know, succession and development of talent for leadership as, and which I was doing and progressing in and, yeah. you know, why would you switch and study work and life stuff? That's a women's issue. Nobody cares about that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So it, there was, it was a different world. And so Got one it. of the things very gratifying to see now is how much, you know, the world has shifted, even though we have so far to go and um, so much to do. There's still uh, been great progress in seeing how who you are as a whole person really matters for who you are, uh, well, in each and every single part of your life. And absolutely, yeah. So uh, I wanted to to talk a little bit about like vision and values and 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 you know the compartmentalization uh, around the four way approach, which you talk about in your book and touch upon around uh, work and family and community and self and this notion that we are actually so disciplined at work. Like at Google, we have something called OKRs, objectives and key results. Mm -hmm. And we as leaders opine at the high level direction of the objectives that we want to achieve. And we kind of leave it to um, the teams to come up with the ideas and the projects and the resources that are needed to deliver the key results to bolster and achieve those higher level objectives in a piecemeal way or you know, in an all-in-one way. And you know, can you talk a little bit about any hypotheses you might have as to like why we're so disciplined and structured and methodical and rigorous at work, but why we're kind of a little bit sloppy at home as it relates to, you know, inspiring our kids with 
a similar set of vision and values. I'm so glad you're asking that because that's one of the questions I, I get you know, from readers and reading groups and people I'm speaking to about parents who lead. Uh, before they've read it, they're like, oh, who wants to be that, you know, that jerk at work who's the micromanager with your kids? Right. That's not what our relationships are like as parents. So like, why would you want to do that? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the answer is that as parents, we are leaders. It's not, this is not about being command and control top down uh, at the top of a hierarchical pyramid. Right. Leadership is about uh, inspiring people toward a better tomorrow, right? It's mobilizing people to come with you to a better place that you have to create a picture of that they can see and that is meaningful to them. And you do that in so many different roles in life when, when you think about it. Um, and as parents, uh, that I, I see, and I think once you start to look at it that way, uh, that is indeed what we're doing, right? We're trying mm -hmm. to help you know our our kids see that tomorrow can be better, uh, and that we're going to get there together. Uh, and you're the most important person in the world to me, and I want to make sure that we just get stronger as we move into the future tomorrow uh, you know, uh, together with a sense of hope. Um, so, if that's what leaders do you know, deal with reality, picture a better tomorrow, figure out with whatever means they've got available, how to get there together with the people who matter most with them, to them. Um, then that is indeed what parents do, don't you think? Absolutely. I think one of the hardest pieces of feedback I received as a parent um, from a friend, who, it, was, it was harsh, but it was good feedback, was your, your kids are not a project, right? And a lot of how I succeeded in life was just hard work, I, you know, studied hard. I got good, you know, results. Um, you work hard. You harvest uh, the fruits of your labor. And, um, you know, there were times in parenting where the it was not able to be managed uh, via a project. We have a course that Google called uh, Leading Within Complexity. And one of the things it talks about is that sometimes in complexity, you just have to engage in, in, in intelligent trial, trial and error right? Experimentation, which you touch upon in the book. But experimentation has a so much uncertainty correlated with it. And it's a little bit unnerving to, to uh, go down that path. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the book, you also touch upon this, this notion of don't be the parent you always imagined yourself to be or wish you, wish you had. Be the parent that your kids need you to be. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of situational leadership and kind of trying to figure out what the right next step is and either double down or fail fast is the hard part about mm -hmm. parenting. Um, do you have any tips on how to embrace that process? Well, it starts with um, your your values and your vision. Like what it, what's most important to you in your life and, and sharing that with you know the people that you are in partnership with and raising your children, whether that's a spouse or friends or extended family, whoever it is, uh, and having some clarity about that. Right. Um, so we, you know, we we describe a simple way for people to articulate their vision of a better future by describing what an ideal day looks like. 15 years in the future, what are you doing with whom each part of the day and what's what's the impact that you're having, the legacy that you're creating um, and, and looking to your past and identifying the critical episodes that have shaped your life, uh, which I don't think I did a very good job of doing in response to your earlier question. No, not at all. It was great. Um, but, you know, having a sense of where you've come from and where you want to go and being able to share that with your kids and anybody else who's interested, anybody else who you're trying to help bring with you uh, to, you know, to a better tomorrow. Um, that having that as a grounding and and being uh, aware of what it is that you're choosing to value and the direction you want to go. That's fundamental to leadership. You read any standard text on leadership or any yeah. list, any guru talking about leadership in any context. That's it. That's that's the rock. Yeah. What do you stand for? Where are you going and why? And and how is how are you using your talents, your your efforts, your particular perspective on reality to to make things better for other people? 
Um, when you have that as your, um, your frame for your attention, for the investment of your effort, uh, you feel a greater sense of confidence in mm -hmm. trying new ways of getting things done, especially if you've done the work of developing relationships with especially your kids, but your partner in parenting and your your colleagues at work and others who matter to you in your life. If you've developed relationships where they can tell you what you're what what you're missing, what what you're not doing right, like you seem to have done in the example you just you just gave us. Uh, it's it's crucial to know what people actually expect of you, not what you think they expect of you. And a, a big chunk, the, the heart of the book, the, the middle part is about dialogues with the most important people in your life and how you talk to, well, your kids about what it is that they really need from you without imposing your will on them or your expectations right. or your needs and really being open to understanding uh, at whatever age they're at, you know, as soon as they can start to communicate, here's what's most important to me, mom, dad. Um, and the more you know about that, the easier it is to then try to align what matters to you with what they need and to then experiment in small ways. I think the key to experimentation and to failing fast is to take smart risks based on, you know, a decent knowledge of where you're going, what matters, like what's what's the path that you're headed down, right? And and what's the impact that you're having on other people? And a small step, not too big, not too not too small, but small enough so that you progress down that path that you're going, that you want to go, mm -hmm. and that you are paying attention to the impact that you're having along the way, gathering data continually, like a scientist in the laboratory of your real life. It makes it less risky. Uh, because you can you you can adjust fast, so right. the, I think the key to experimenting is being rooted in what matters most to you and to the people who are affected by what it is you're trying, and to take small enough steps that you can continue to adjust as you learn what's working, what's not. Right. I, I will cop to being very simplistic before I had kids as to what kind of a parent I would be. I was, um, I'm enamored by babies, I still am. And, you know, I was like, I'm gonna be a great mom when it comes to doing all the things, the feeding and the this and the that and the bathing and, you know, it, like squeezing their little cheeks and all that stuff. And then I fast forward yeah, to, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to, you know, 30 years from now, it's good, Thanksgiving is gonna be so fun. Um, but this interim phase is something I kind of just glossed over in my visioning, right? And. Um, so, you know, and, and you just touched upon this in, in this prior section, which is like a, an honest set of conversations with your partner um, around the vision and the values and that whole um, like grokking, like the framework within which you want to operate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very difficult, crucial conversation to have with a spouse. And we talk a lot at Google about not just the what you do, but the how you do it. Mm -hmm. And to get the how you do it is very difficult. I think you use the words like, you know, there's a spectrum between honesty and cruelty. And there's an element of like, if you're on the receiving end of, you know, feedback, that sometimes there's a defensiveness and or like in the way you frame your feedback, it could be accusatory. Yep. How, how do you kind of strike the right soft skills balance um, in having these honest conversations yeah. with someone you're very comfortable with under your same roof. Say the last part again. Under the same roof, right? Like yeah. you get very comfortable and therefore you loosen up a little. Like at work, we actually usually apply a filter. Um, but at home, sometimes we fail to do that. Well, this is, you know, you asked earlier about, um, you know, why don't why don't we take ourselves more seriously as leaders at home? Right. And it's it's you know, this is what you're saying. Similar, now, yeah. We take it for granted. We just assume, oh, yeah. that's no, you know, I don't have to do any work here because it's just you know it it is and it is and it will be. But of course, uh, all relationships require attention and care. So we we spend a lot of time in the book describing you know, how to have conversations with the different people who matter in your life and. Uh, we we lay out a, a simple way to approach them with uh, curiosity. That is crucial. You, ha you have to be interested in the other, which is probably the hardest part in leadership you know, development. Mm -hmm. training is is taking the perspective of other people and looking beyond you know your own nose to 
right. take what I call the leadership leap and see yourself through the eyes of other people uh, into their heart, their mind. And so you got to be curious about that. And that requires discipline, practice, some emotional maturity. You got to, you know, resist the impulse to be, you know, seeking revenge, you know, for all the ways in which you've been hurt and disappointed, et cetera, et cetera. So curiosity, a sense of like, okay, this, this relationship is important in some way to me. And I want to help to cultivate that and to say that. So curiosity, collaboration, and, and a commitment. That's the third of the four C's that there's a decent mnemonic, a mnemonic for helping to remember. Yes. How do you have these conversations with curiosity, a sense of collaboration and commitment to building a shared future? And then the fourth, which is the most important, and that is compassion. Start yes. with for you. Ah. Because okay. you, of course, have messed up. You know, and as a parent, you know that you do this every day, all the time. Yeah. My kids. Oh my are, God, the guilt. <laughs> well, you, yeah, guilt and anxiety about trying new things and trying things that are going to be good for you and your work and your kids and your community. That is huge as a barrier to change. It's one of the main things that holds people back. Well, I couldn't do this because it would be selfish or people would think I'm being a jerk or I'm just thinking about myself. Um, and, and this is, I think, you know, as in the talks and work with clients and students over the last six months in pandemic times, this is the thing I hear most about. Yes. Is the sense of uh, guilt at trying to do something new and, and beating yourself up for not being able to do what you used to be able to do. Right. Um, and that's why compassion is so is so crucial. Uh, again, starting with compassion for yourself and accepting your, the limits of what you are able to do. And and once you and you practice that and get a little bit better at that, and of course it's a lifelong project, um, you know, you become a little bit more understanding and accepting of other people, which is essential. Now, I this is probably more than you wanted to hear about you know, th these conversations, these crucial conversations, but I think those are the keys. Being right. really interested in their perspective, not what you want to impose on them, because you already know that what you think. <laughs> For you're, sure. there to, yeah. you're there to learn, you're there to build, strengthen the relationship so that you can do what you need to do together. You find that common ground and to be accepting of the limits of what others are, are able to do. Absolutely. So Grace uh, from the live stream has a question. Okay. Um, so it, it, as as opposed to the conversation with your partner in life to to raise these little humans, it's yeah. more directed at the conversations with the kids. Yeah. Um, it's some, it's hard to engage them at, in this day and age. They're just, you know, fraught with so much entertainment that's so fast. And like, I mean, to, to get my kids to pay attention to me versus their video games or whatever it is that that their YouTube or whatever it is that is coming at them very fast and is highly entertaining. When they're talking to me, they're kind of bored. And to Grace's point, um, she says, often when I ask my kids questions, they respond with, I don't know. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions on how we can structure the conversation to flush out what they want? Yeah. Now, I am not a child psychologist or a developmental psychologist, but my colleague, my co-author, Alyssa Westring and I, we yes. did a lot, a lot, a lot of research and we curated the best of what we could find about you know child development and dialogues with kids and it's in that chapter which i think is my favorite chapter of the book because it's uh it's it's rich and we learned a ton also from the people in our lab you know that that worked with us in developing all this material right a couple thoughts i mean it, it's never going to work perfectly uh, grace you know it's just it never is right <laughs> so start with that give yourself mm -hmm. a break but give them a break Again, compassion, understanding, not to say, you know, that you should not care or be, you know, interested, uh, but you start with, um, you're the most important person in the world to me, and I want to do everything possible to protect you and to give you what you need. I mean, expressing that on a regular basis, that's, yes. of course, crucial. And, and you know, we, we don't always remember to do that. And so it's it's useful, simple as it is for me to say, to keep that in mind. But to get substantive responses from ornery children or, <laughs> or who are distracted or just being, you know, being children. Yes. It, it helps a lot to say, to give them something very specific to respond to. So, you know, you say to your, your kids, you have to give some thought to this, of course, in advance. What 
what does each one of them really need from me? And we have a set of exercises that helps you to flesh this out. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Just think through it. What is it that this child needs from me? What do I think she needs? What do I think she thinks she needs from me? Right. Now, let me see if I can put those in words that she'll understand, whether she's you know five or eight or 12 or whatever. And then you, 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 you arrange, and this is the hard part, you know, finding the time, say, look, your, our relationship, my being able to care for you and to give you everything you need is really important to me. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking with you about how I can do that better. Would you be willing to do that? So you invite the conversation and most kids are going to say, well, okay, yeah, sure. Just like, so long as I can, you know, be playing my video games afterwards for extra time or <laughs> hey bribery is not off the table sometimes so, but then you get there <laughs> you know once you find some time where it's like no no other things going on yeah um then you say look this and this is a, a directly addressing grace's question how do you get past the i don't know you say this is what i think is important to you honey do i have yeah. it right and you lay out the top three things as specifically as you can these are the three things that I think are most important to you. And you name them mm -hmm. and you're, you're specific about them. Is that, is that the way you see it? Are these the things that are important to you or is there something different? And what am I missing? Because I'm sure I don't know everything about what really matters to you. And I really want to know. So tell me what's right or what's wrong about the three things that I just mentioned. And when, and when you do that, you do a couple of really important things. First, you're telling your kid, I've actually thought about what you right. care, care about. This is what I think you, you think. So and, yeah. you know, I've actually given some thought to that. And yeah. that sends an implicit message like, oh, wow, mom's thinking about me. That's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Because, uh, of course, kids need that. They want that. They want to know that, you think, that you're thinking about their needs. Yeah. But then when you're saying, I'm, I'm not really sure if I'm accurate here. This is what I think. But what I really want to know is what you think. That's what's important for me to know. So tell me, where am I wrong? And when you do that, you express the kind of humility that I'm sure you teach in leadership training at Google. A thousand percent, uh, yes. That, you know, you've got to be vulnerable and say, and, and with open arms say, look, I know that I don't have the full story here. So tell me, what am I missing? When you do that with something specific, then they're going to they're going to be much more likely to be able to say to you well no that's not exactly right and then say, okay well then tell me what is and can you give me an example and tell me more about why that's important to you so and the specificity great. helps drive and hone in on that you have to have that because if you if you say to your kid how can i be a better mom yeah they're gonna oh, say give me more kids get out of my life <laughs> that's humbling yeah don't ever want to pose that question. Okay, Kate has a question for us. Uh, right. For parents with more than one child, how yeah. do you balance what methods may work with one child with what works for another? For example, some kids may need more structure and others yeah. need less. This is actually really top of mind for me because both my kids, same genetics, same upbringing, same environment, um, but very different, right? Um, so how do you modulate your approaches depending on the personalities at hand? I, this is uh, one of my favorite topics because we had a mantra. We have three kids, right? Right. Boy, girl, I uh, can't imagine. Boy, boy, right. girl. Okay. Um, I have two boys. Crazy. They're all, they're three years apart. And our mantra for the kids growing up, which we said to them all the time, was everybody's different. Mm. And that pervaded everything that we tried to do as, as parents, as a family. No one is the same. Everyone is different in terms of what they're good at, what they like to do, the way they want to be treated. Right. And we have to try to find out what each of us is all about and respect that and love that, accept that and, and invest in that. Yep. So, um, you know, the, the the parents who make sure that each child has the exact same number of cookies <laughs> uh, are, are doing it wrong <laughs> because, right. because equality is not equity you know that's right having the same for everybody usually just, and you know this as a manager and this is i'm sure one of the ways in which you become a better parent by being a great leader at work is that you understand that your people need something different from you because they're different Absolutely. i don't know does that does that help kate I hope so. 
I hope so. I mean, the number of times I had to, uh, you know, legislate a fight between the kids, like he got 43 sprinkles and I got 39. And, oof, you know, I'm like, oh, my gosh, am I in Twilight Zone? Do I really have to have this debate? Um, but it happens. And well, it's reality. Can, and you can help them by saying, like, do you both need the same number? I mean, and why is that important? Let's get right. into that. Like, so you, you can challenge the assumptions that they're making about the need for um, things to be equitable treatment or unsprinkle distribution. Yeah. I mean, there's different ways of being fair. Like, okay, so Absolutely. what would be fair? It does it have to be the same? Right. Our kids all went to different schools. Huh. They lived in the same house. They went to different schools because they had different needs. Got it. And you know, they understood that there might have been some resentment about that along the way, but you know, one went to public school, one went to a private school, and the other went to a school for kids with special needs because they all had different um, needs as students, as growing little humans, as you right. like to call them. And I'm sure you were able to articulate and be transparent about the rationale and you know, have them understand the, the, the root causes behind your decisions. As much as we could, as, you know, as we grew older, certainly. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah, so, yeah, but that principle applies starting from day one, I think. Yes, mm -hmm. makes sense. We have one more question um, from Christine. Uh, can you speak to the art of boundary setting while continuing to encourage autonomy and maintain trust? Oh, that's that's huge, Christine. Really good question. I'm glad you're asking about that, um, and and especially when we're you know working from home, living at work, as as so many of us are doing now, um, where the physical boundaries are no longer, and we need the psychological boundaries as well as physical boundaries to enable us to do the things that matter when they matter and to be able to switch roles and attention you know more rapidly than than you know we did in the before times uh so a couple things on this first these conversations that i'm talking about having with your kids as well as with your colleagues in addition to your spouse about what is it that we need from each other to be able to move forward together in harmony uh, and, and in mutual respect and mutual support. Uh, that can drill down to the very specific, what do we need you know, today in terms of time and attention? And the more you can frame your need for you know, undistracted time, I mean, that's essentially what boundaries are about, right? Is undistracted mm -hmm. attention. Attention is perhaps your most precious asset as a parent, as a leader. So where do you devote it? Once again, starting with what matters most to you. So beginning the day with some sense of intention uh, and then having a, a clear sense of purpose. The more you can bring that into your consciousness on a regular basis, the easier it is for you to decide what not to attend to. But then in negotiating those boundaries, like, okay, honey, I need an hour just sitting in a closet today at some point between noon and 6 p.m. so that I can just be by myself. Because if I do that, I think that I'm going to be a better spouse, a better parent, and, and a better, you know, supplier of resources for our family through my work. And here's why. Uh, what, what, what do you think about that? And, and so that you have some kind of conversation, that's a slightly facetious example, but the idea of, of maintaining boundaries that work yeah. for other people is for you to help them see how what you're doing is good for them, not yeah. you. It gets that's kind of sense. the leadership mindset that parents have to have. How what you're doing is not just about having you know more impact at work and making more money and having more responsibility and more recognition it's it's also for what you bring to the family what you bring to your kids what you bring to your relationship what you bring to your community and that's why this concept of four-way wins that i started writing about in the earlier book total leadership and that it's really been the kind of core ideas how do you make change happen day to day as well as big big scale that's going to be good for you, your family, your work, and your community. What what things can you do to make all four of those domains of your life better? Right. Think in those terms. It's easier for you to say no to certain things and right. yes to 
others and to help others see how it's in their interests for you to be not attending to them. Right. And in the book, you talk about the overlaying the parameters of importance and um, how you're actually like in reality, pragmatically mapping to, to that level of importance and your level of satisfaction. Um, and that, yeah. that was a really helpful exercise um, to, to undergo and, and do for myself. The paradigm he's trying to describe is, a, is along four parameters of, uh, you know, your career, your yourself, your family, and your community, and kind of taking the pie and splitting it across the the paradigms of importance and um, how you're actually pragmatically spending that time and your level of satisfaction with what how that um, how how that maps out. And for me, it was a very alarming uh, set of numbers to look at. And um, in the book, he talks a little bit about something called the status quo trap um, and how that. Um, you you wake up every morning and you get stuck in your daily routines and you just go through the motions. But once you kind of talk about the visioning in 15 years um, and what your importance levels are, there are times where you have to make little uh, bite-sized changes to try to bridge between that vision and then the current um, state of affairs. And this exercise really brings to light this notion of how how much the delta is. Are you kind of mapping to your values and that level of importance? Or are you really far off? And should you really investigate making those changes? Stu, I did a very poor uh, no, summary. No, you did a great job, attempt. I think. <laughs> you asked, you know, do people, what do people see when they do that exercise? And it, it's really useful to yeah. do it for yourself and then to, with your partner. Absolutely. And, and guess about what they would say about themselves. And that's where you find like, oh, you think you devote uh, you know, fifty percent of your attention to family. That's interesting because I, that's not what I would have said. So, Stu, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I, I'm sure you went through some sort of this form of exercise with your uh, wife, say, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Were there values or visions or like deltas that were completely latent and surprises to you, and or vice versa to her? You know, uh, we're celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary. Wow! And congratulations. In a couple of months, and you know, it's not always been smooth. Of course, it never sure. is. But yeah. I can tell you that, um, you know, in some ways now it's better than it was in many ways at the at the beginning when we were just young and trying to figure everything out. Uh, but one of the things that I think has been uh, essential for our continued growth as a partnership is that we started out with um, a pretty good and deep understanding of what we believed was important in, in life. And it actually mm -hmm. began the very first moment we met. Um, you know, we were at this group interview uh, for a, a, a psychology PhD program, and there were eight other applicants that we sat in a, you know, in, in a session with for six hours with two faculty members observing our behavior and our interpersonal competence or lack thereof. And oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, it was terrible. Uh, and as I say, neither of us got in, but we, we rode the train together um, back to uh, Manhattan from this location and spent that hour um, falling in love. And, but the topic was, you know, all the other people in the group and our evaluations of them. <laughs> How meta. And we, we agreed on everyone. And that was really the beginning. Of, that's very telling. Know, it, it really was. It was, yeah. uh, so it's, I mean, that's not exactly what you asked, but I mean, the, the, the big idea here is if you, uh, you, you know, you've got to have some common ground in terms Absolutely. of your values. And if, if you, if those, if there's none, then it's really, it's really hard. So it sounds like from the very get-go and from the very beginning, there was a lot of alignment. So those kinds of conversations, there weren't a lot of surprises because you you started off on the right foot actually talking about those things organically and inherently. Yeah, and we and we took that idea pretty seriously as we continued to grow and deal with all the you know trials and joys of living together. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that that's essential. And 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 again, we do that in our business life, like you can. Right. You could, I'm sure, tell me what you know Google's values are, um, but could you tell me what your family's values are? 
I, right. you don't have to answer that. I mean, you can if you want, but you know, that's that's an idea that I think is you know helps to get back to your original question, people to see that oh yeah, like leadership science, I could use that as a parent yeah. because of course. I'll be honest with you. I only articulated them when I started having trouble with the kids. Mm -hmm. um, so it, never before, like it wasn't like a known thing. And then, you know, we just migrated through the course of life and evolved. Uh, it was, it was done as a trigger or reaction to tougher times when yeah. I needed to, to reel it in. Um, yeah. Evan has a question for us. Um, you know, he thanks us for our time. Um, and he mentions that a lot of this has been anchored around older kids. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, you know, a parent of, of toddlers um, <laughs> who are always calm and thoughtful participants in the discussion rather than irrational little terrorists. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, are there some methods that you can kind of um, apply to, to toddlers who are a little less able to be reasoned with uh, rather than rather than older kids. Yeah, and it's harder. Uh, it is harder. When, when, <laughs> before kids are sentient beings that have the right. capacity of speech, uh, it's harder to find out what they're really thinking. But uh, you know, the, the thing that we, we touch on a bit in the book is is through play. You know, play is the yeah. language of of the emotions for for kids. And if um, you can find ways to help them uh, give ideas to the to the um, feelings that they're expressing in their play or their art, uh, you know, whatever it is that they're able to do to express themselves, because you know, the human expression of emotion begins early, early on, yeah. and the attentive parent will help to give language to the feelings that are being expressed in play. Um, so when you see your kid, uh, you know, holding a doll tightly or, you know, smashing a truck, mm -hmm. you can, you know, theorize about what that might be, you know, uh, an expression of, and then inquire is, you know, is that, is that accurate? Can you say more about that? Or, or how is it, you know, how's that doll feeling? How's, what's that trucks like, you know, future going to look like, or mm -hmm. you know, what I, I'm just making up examples. No, I know it's the idea of, uh, using, using play and other forms of creative expression and to understand those as an expression of a child's feeling state. Yeah. And, and play is so different child to child. Like my, my older one used to just line up cars all day, every day. And my younger one is just like a lot of like headbutting and aggression and, you know, trying to use sand art to, you mm -hmm. know, figure out how to communicate like, like, sorry, little figurines in sand, not sand art. Um, mm -hmm. So the challenge is um, like, uh, play therapy and, and and extracting feelings out of play is it needs to be very custom tailored to that kid and that kid's inherent interests. Um, and that's really hard to tease out at times. Yeah. Everybody's different. Everybody's right. different. Uh, yes, yes, yes. There's no one size fits like you all. Said, with in, your three kids. In parenting. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's so important to keep that in mind, especially you know, if you've got more than one child and you realize the second one is not the same as the first one, like, why can't you be more like that one? Uh, Ever feel yeah. that way? <laughs> Isai has a question for us. Um, I like the idea of using OKRs for parenting. I wonder if you could elaborate on that a bit, uh, although she possibly doesn't want to take it the wrong way. But um, can you talk a little bit about that exercise? Well, I think the, the big idea here is to have a sense of you know, where, where's the child headed, you know, or just what's important to them. Uh, here again, you know, parents can get in their own way by imposing their own goals on a child. And it's very easy to do that. And of course, you can't escape doing that, right? Every parent is going to, at some level, have some sense of disappointment that the child is not who exactly who you want them to be. Yeah. And if, if you think you never felt that, well, then you, you're probably just not thinking uh, because I don't I don't know anyone who does, hasn't had that feeling at some point. So so starting with, um, OK, you're separating your expectations, your desires, 
you know, the, the frustrated hopes of your own life projected onto them. Uh, it's, of course, this is, you know, natural for all parents to do that. Just, just try to I'm tune in. So guilty of that. Yeah. You're doing that. You're probably doing that. And it's not helping your kids. Uh, yeah. So starting with that, but then again, as much as you can tuning into what is it that they care about? What matters most to them? Not just what they need from you, but in their own lives now, what really matters? The more freedom you can give them to talk about that and then to put that in terms of, well, you know, what, what would that look like a year from now, six months from now? Um, what, what would, what would feel good to you? What would make you feel like you are becoming more of the person that you want to become in whatever words you want to say that. Yeah. And then to convert that into goals, um, and, and to offer your support like good leaders do. All right. That's, what's important to you. That makes sense to me. I want to help you. What's the best way for me to do that? Here's some ideas that I have. I could get you lessons. I could get you a tutor. I could get you this. Would that be helpful? Well, no, actually, what would be helpful is if you just let me talk to you for 15 minutes a day about what it is that I'm going through and trying to become a better pianist or a better, you know, weaver or whatever it is that I, right, right, that I right. care about. So, I'm super guilty of this. Like I, I went through a, a phase, a very inelegant moment that I will cop to and admit to. I, uh, I, I was trying to get my kid to read better books, better by my per per perception and perspective, not by his. And he, the kid's reading, right? He was reading like all these crazy fantasy novels. And I was like, don't you want to read mysteries? Don't you want to read this? Don't you want to read that? Don't you want to read, read historical fiction? Um, and I realized that I was being annoying and um i needed to let go a bit and just be stoked and excited that the kid was reading right um so that autonomy i mean it's something that again it took feedback from someone to point out the fact that i was being a little overbearing and imposing my own views on like you know uh what i thought was the best path rather than giving him the space to to make his own decisions i mean that's such a lovely example because it's i mean it's just what you don't want your boss to do at work totally right? Yeah, so well, annoying. Don't, don't tell me what you know. You want me how you want me to do what I do. I, you know, bring out the best in me. Yep, and that's that's doubly true for us as parents, and and so that's that's just a great example because it it speaks to your developing insight about how you were imposing, you know, your wish for the kind of person you want them to be on them yeah. instead of you know doing the the harder thing, which I think is our it's our motif here in this whole conversation. And that is letting go parents, and trusting a bit that, you know, the character is set they're, they're They have a good head on their shoulders and, you know, letting go. They're going to be who they're going to be. Right. Right. And, right. and accepting that, loving them for that. I mean, that's, I think the hardest part of leadership. And I think it's the hardest part of being a parent. Absolutely. Like one of my kids, as I alluded to earlier, had special needs. Um, right. So he um, he had a psychotic break in, as a teenager, and oh has so a, a serious mental illness, right? And this is a, a kid with immense talent and you know a capacity, um, but you know has been disabled by uh, an illness that is just horrible and really uh, un it's un basically untreatable. Uh, there's no cure. That's and really difficult. When some when a challenge is time bound, it's very it's already difficult. But when there is no time boundedness, there's an element of sometimes not falling into hopelessness, if you will. Well, right. And so and the, one of the great challenges for me personally with him is to be able to you know accept and love him for who he is, and to just help him each day to do what you know is going to make his life a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And and that and that this gets to the point of accepting them for who they are yes, and in embracing them for who they are and, and not trying to make them into something that you need them to be for yourself. Right. And again, I, I think that is a really hard thing to do really hard. And, Absolutely. and if you're not able to do it or you struggle with that, well, you know, welcome to the world of being a parent. Yeah. Everybody. And, and it, in that vein, Bora had a, a similar question, which is, yeah. Do you have a recommendation on ways to recognize when to step in and guide a kid and when to step back and give them the autonomy they need? It is a really hard balance yeah, to strike, right? 
at different ages, right? As you know, as they get older, the you know the the greater freedom comes with greater risk, of course. Um, I think right. it's, I think it's important to establish boundaries for you know what is acceptable and what is not, uh, based on you know your understanding of reality and 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 what is you know uh, going going to be you know keeping them safe and and what's you know legal uh, yeah. <laughs> uh but you know the more freedom the better generally speaking and i think we tend to err on the side of you know restricting that freedom and, and once again you think about the leaders who you love and admire in your life they give you a lot of freedom yeah right that's true although like so for example my kids went through a, a tough time uh for for a period of time with uh profanity and physicality with each other and things like that and you know bringing forth the notion that those things are not safe and healthy and may land you in jail at a certain point. Um, I was grateful to be able to nip it. Uh, they're nine and 11, but had they been 16 and 18, they could have been driving around. They could have had yeah. a lot of more negative peer pressure. Um, so there is a, a time element around the severity of some of the behaviors and the boundary setting that is appropriate for that particular age range, um, yeah, it's, which is hard to cover in broad strokes and general practices. Right? It's a so. dynamic process. You got to pay yes. attention to this on a regular basis. And, you know, to your point earlier about how you became a better parent because of what you learned about your role at work, I that is so true. And I see that all the time. And, and you just give a little bit of thought to how have I become a better parent? What have I learned about being a parent from you know, my career? Yes. Um, so I, I don't know if we have time for it, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about what you have indeed learned about yeah. maybe just one thing. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's a uh, diffusing tension, right? Like something, um, at home, I went through some challenges with my older one who's very high EQ and uses my own logic against me. Right. So I said to him, um, I think I mentioned this to you before I said to him, you know, it's not about what you wear, or what you look like. It's about the words that you use and how you make people feel, right? So then it was time for a piano recital and the kid refused to put on a nice outfit. And he's like, mom, you said, right? It's not about what you wear and what you look like. And I was like, oh, just do it because I said so. And I was like, that's the parent I promised myself I would never become. Mm. Um, but, you know, he's kind of right. And I kind of let him get away with, uh, with you know, less nice clothes, much to my in-laws chagrin, but, um, but you know, like he was kind of on point, um, mm -hmm. but sometimes those debates and arguments didn't go very well. Mm -hmm. um, and diffusing those uh, situations, I went to a cognitive behavioral therapist for seven yes. months to try wow. to figure out like some techniques to, to tackle that. And a lot of that actually transferred over to the workplace. I will say like COVID has made communication harder um, when there's disagreements, tensions are higher, the stakes are, hard, are, are higher as well. and a lot of those techniques come in, come in handy um, in the workplace as well. We, yeah. have, we have one more question, or oh, we okay. have two more questions, oh my gosh. Um, and we have very limited time. Um, let's go with, with John's question. Uh, right. Sometimes family relationships can crystallize and become rigid or cold. This happened with my own parents. How can you break the ice with a relationship that seems frozen, kids or otherwise? Oof, this is question. a heavy one. Yeah. yeah, thank you for asking that. It's never too late. That's yeah. the first thing to keep in mind. I mean, even in your dying breath, it's never too late. And of course, when people are dying, this is what they talk about. This is what they think about. Yeah. The most important relationships in their life. That's what they're. That's what's on their minds. There's a lot of interesting research on that. Um, but what you asked about is how how you get to something better when it's been frozen. And as a leader, you can and are. Uh, really uh, able to say our relationship is important to me i want to make it stronger is that something that you'd be willing to spend some time talking with me about uh, to you know here's why you're important to me and to my future here's why we matter to me i'd like to spend some time you know making it better strengthening it ensuring a stronger future for it's us. It's very courageous to say those words when things are indeed frozen. Well, you know? and you know, the what's the worst that could happen? Well, the person's not interested in having or doesn't prioritize the relationship. Sorry, Dad, not interested. 
I'm out. Yeah. yeah. And as a leader, it's just I, heartbreaking, actually. Well, and then, you know, you cry or you, you, yeah. I mean, we've all had our hearts broken, right? It's yeah. part of being alive. <laughs> you know, I've had great disappointment in my life, and as I'm sure you have too. I mean, everybody does. And, but as leaders, and I think this is an important note for us to get in before we're done, the thing that we need to do perhaps most importantly for our kids, for the people who depend on us, who look up to us, is to tell the truth and to right. hear the truth and to deal with reality. We have a problem with that in America today with you know people in the executive office who are not dealing with reality. And as a result, people are you know fearful and frenetic dealing with reality, seeing it as it is, as, as is crucial. And sometimes it hurts to hear things as yeah. they are because it's not what you want. We, we like to sugarcoat a lot. Yeah, but it's yeah. not healthy. It's not, it, sometimes and it's more effective to be direct. It, it almost always is better to get at what's real. Yeah. And people trust you more when you don't bullshit them. That's and, right. that, and that goes for kids starting really young because mm -hmm. they know they know humans have a great radar for for authenticity and the truth and yeah respecting yeah. their you know and when, and when you're not giving that to them they don't trust you and yeah. and you know leaders deal in trust that's the currency <laughs> right. if you don't have the trust of the people around you you can't lead them they're not yeah. going to with you and so you build trust by by helping them to face the truth about the way things are. So again, the worst that can happen is is that they say, "Yeah, I'm not interested in talking with you now. I don't want to have a relationship with you now. You you know, I don't want you in my life." And you can you can say how that makes you feel and what you yeah. want. Well, what can I do to to make it better if, if that's something that and you Sometimes want. there's just a cooling off period rather than the permanence of the hurt yeah. that's trying to yeah. There almost always is. But it yeah. starts with, as you say, having the courage to say, you're important to me. I want to make things stronger between us. Here's why you matter to me. Can we spend some time talking about that? And then tell them, here's what I think is important to you. Do I have it right? And be willing to be wrong. Be willing to be corrected. Be humble about yeah. the limits of your knowledge. And about it's valuable to be corrected. It's valuable to to figure out the, the deltas and the feedback. And that's how you learn. That is how you learn. And if, if you say, All right, I'm right and you're wrong, or here's the, here's, the, here's the reality that you need to know, then, you know, okay, that's another wall you're making me put up. Right, right. Well, we are at time and uh, this has been, a, we have a few questions that went unanswered. And so apologies to, to, to those people who tuned in and we didn't get to your questions. Um, but it was great to see so much activity in the comments. Dr. Friedman, it was an honor and a privilege uh, and a delight to have this conversation with you. We are, please don't be a stranger. Please come see us at Google again. We could benefit tremendously from your years of expertise and from your experience that so uh, thank you very much for your time, Dr. Freeman. Thank you very much for everyone who tuned in. And until next time. Thank you. Thank you.